Yeah, welcome to the 28th Chaos Communication Congress. So. So 20 years, 28 years is quite a bit of time. And uh, so what we really would like to know is who is here for the first time? Wow, cool. <laughs> so we, we always said that our goal with these congresses is basically growing the cultural space, growing the idea space of hacking, of hackers, of the hacker mindset. And we have traveled quite a bit in the last years. And so there, you know, probably the saying of the second half of the chessboard coming from this ancient saying about the Indian king who wanted to award the inventor of chess. And the inventor of chess said, yeah, I want one piece of grain for the first field, two pieces on the second field, eight pieces, uh, four pieces on the third field, eight pieces on the fourth field, and so on. So an exponential growth curve. And what we're seeing now in this year is that we are technology development-wise now in the second half of the chessboard. That means everything is going ever faster all the time. Uh, it doesn't mean that this will continue this way, but this is part of the explanation why all things that we're seeing are going ever more crazy all the time. Because technology is driving now everything. So Cory Doctorow, who will speak later, said that you don't buying a car anymore you're buying a computer that has a motor and wheels as peripherals. And this is basically what, what we are here about. We are about to learn, to exchange opinions, ideas, and the thing that we should keep in mind is that what we do here really matters. Because lots of people out there are just sitting there like, yeah, deer in the headlight when it comes to technology development, whereas we strive to try to understand what we're doing, and we really want to understand how technology works. We make it our own. We want to make it working for us. So that doesn't mean that everything will be happy and fine, because what we see this year very clearly, which is what Evgeny will be talking about in a moment, is that also dictatorships and oppressors and large corporations have master technology. So they are buying people like us. They are able to just get the technology minds that they need by giving us money. And what it also means is that what we do as a community and what we do not as a community, what we decide to not to do, really matters. It's not like, like playing a little bit in the, in the corner anymore. It's we are in the center of so, uh, society's development. And this is something that we should keep in mind while being here. But above of all, um, we want to have fun. So let's have fun and have a nice Case Communication Congress. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, it's very odd for me to be speaking after you've been promised to have some fun because it's a rather uh, gruesome subject. Uh, that I'll talk about. And it's also very odd for me to be playing this part of uh, the Grinch who stole Christmas uh, this year in part because I've been repeatedly talking about the way in which dictators have been using uh, technology for their own purposes, uh, to crack down on free speech, to engage in surveillance. Uh, I've been saying that for several years, but this year suddenly I found that the media and the public began paying attention. Uh, and I would argue that it happened in part because of the Arab Spring, uh, because uh, some documents were discovered that showed that technology companies were pitching their products, and their solutions to dictators, but in part because the conversation has turned from talking about some abstract technology that is being used by dictators to the role that Western, and not necessarily Western, uh, technology companies are playing and supplying those technologies. So suddenly the tables have turned from talking just about technology in the abstract to actually kicking some of these companies in the butt, uh, which is interesting and which is also something that the media can easily play on. Uh, but again, I just would like to emphasize before we get into the substance of this is that many of the same points have been made for many years 
including by many people in this audience. This is not a new discussion. It did not start this year. This year is when the media suddenly picked up uh, on some of the messages. I would also like to caution before we proceed any further is that this is not an extremely comprehensive overview of every single technology and every single company that is uh, being used by dictators. Uh, there are hundreds of them. Uh, I will point you immediately to a couple of interesting resources. Some of you uh, may have seen those. Bloomberg has put together this very interesting visualization uh, wired for repression, which allows you to actually click on a particular country uh, and see both uh, who's buying this technology, what kind of technology it is, who's supplying it. It's dynamic, you can browse this in real time and you'll get a much better overview of many of the particular technologies and companies involved. I'll just mention two others briefly. Some of you may have seen the spy files which were put together by WikiLeaks, Sony, uh, Privacy International and a bunch of other partners uh, which delivers many of the same information in a somewhat different format. For a more investigative take, I would also urge you to check out the Wall Street Journal's um, huge series called Censorship Incorporated, which actually has some nice narrative, uh, and so does uh, Bloomberg and the Wikileaks site, which actually go to the specific uh, detail uh, of what technologies, what companies, and so forth and so forth. So today I'll take a more of a macro level view and try to focus on um, what's happening and what we can do and why I believe some of the solutions that have been proposed, like sanctions, uh, are not going to entirely solve the problem. Uh, I assume that this is a technical audience and you guys know a lot of this stuff much better than I do, so I'll just uh, be very uh, brief while talking about particular technologies. Uh, so if you look at what kind of gear dictators are using, and for what purposes, some of it is self-obvious. It's trying to control communication channels, whether it's email, whether it's text messaging, some of it is done uh, on a very primitive basis just by tracking keywords, some of it is done a little bit more sophisticated by looking at location and even particular users. Online filtering is something we've known for a while, it's been going on for decades, uh, again, nothing new here. Intelligent video surveillance is something that we're increasingly seeing being supplied by Chinese companies, and I will talk about that in a second by companies like Huawei who are expanding all over the world and are providing video surveillance supposedly to monitor traffic on the roads and in some one bizarre case they claim they do it to provide long distance education uh, while uh, it is reasonable to expect that many of the same technologies are being used also to monitor uh, protests, uh, dissent and whatnot. What I found particularly uh, interesting and disturbing, for example, in Tunisia, is that it's not just surveillance. It's not just monitoring what people do. Uh, you may have seen a recent story in Bloomberg News that uh, discussed how the Tunisian authorities actually modifying the content of some email messages and either uh, sort of putting some gibberish in them to confuse people, or as in one case discussed in that article, they're actually inserting, for example, pornography images in work-related emails, right? That way they're trying to embarrass and not argue harass uh, the recipients, thus creating uh, a very disturbing trend where people are no longer confident in the technology they're using. And again, this gear, we'll talk about the companies that provide them, but this is more or less what's happening. And the first question that I think arises in many of our minds is why we can just ban these technologies? Why can't we just ban these companies from supplying this gear to dictators? I think here the answer is that it's very hard to implement any kind of global ban that would actually ban all technologies and all technology companies from being supplied to all countries. I've just listed three cases which I think will help you grasp why it's very hard to implement bans and sanctions that work well. In the first case, you have an American company, Blue Coat, that as some of you may know has been building mostly um, internet censorship and internet filtering technology. And this technology ended up in Syria and thanks to the efforts uh, of telecomics, we figured out that uh, it is actually being used in Syria even though uh, the United States government prohibits Western, well, American companies from selling technology to Syria. Well, what happened in that case is that Blue Code claims they were selling this technology to a distributor in the United Arab Emirates, who actually claimed that the ultimate destination of this gear was Iraq, uh, and there are no sanctions uh, on Iraq. 
And Blue Coat said that, hey, we thought it was going to Iraq. It ended up in Syria. It's not our problem. Uh, now, of course, um, it's the distributors who are taking the fire for this because the Western companies just claim it's not us. We ship it to some place, and then it ends up, we don't know where exactly it ends up. Another technology company that recently got into a lot of heat for this is an Israeli company, uh, which more or less got itself into a similar kind of trouble. They claimed they were just shipping technology to Denmark, and uh, the distributor in Denmark was actually contractually obligated to keep that technology in Denmark, but then that technology ended up in Iran, which, as you can judge, uh, is not particularly good news for any Israeli company because, uh, again, there are uh, laws and sanctions prohibiting them from engaging uh, with trade in Iran. And now, uh, other than suffering um, a huge fall in the stock markets, this company uh, also risks, its executives risk getting quite a few years in prison and huge fines. Uh, again, their excuse is that it all ended up in our distributors' hands. The other example, uh, the last example here is, again, uh, an American technology company, NetApp, which used to run um, an application that was eventually bought by an Italian company called Area. And this company, uh, because there were no sanctions on doing any kind of technology work in Syria, was actually free to ship this technology to Syria. So we end up with um, an Italian company getting some gear from the Americans, sending them to Syria, which again, if it was done directly, would be illegal. Sanctions wouldn't cover it. Uh, again, NetApp managed to get away. Uh, even though Bloomberg had uncovered emails that showed that NetApp engineers were actually aware that the technology was heading to Syria and that they were actually configuring it uh, in the process. Again, the only thing that can be done here, and I'm just illustrating you two recent stories on this, is that we can, we can ban the distributors. Right? We can make sure that distributors that are located in America or are located in the European Union that they actually suffer the consequences and that they are banned from shipping any of this gear uh, to countries run by dictators. That, however, I think is not going to be uh, fully effective in part because there are just so many other countries involved in this trade. Right? One of the recent reports from one of the surveillance fairs that ran in the Washington Post uh, estimated that there were representatives from about 43 countries buying such technology gear. And obviously, a lot of those countries are not in the European Union, that are not in the US. And it's, I think, useful to think what would happen if um, some of this American or European uh, surveillance gear is being shipped to, say, Moldova or South Sudan. It's actually interesting that uh, another recent article by Bloomberg actually found a representative from South Sudan at one of those um, technology fairs. And it's very interesting because South Sudan is just five months old. Uh, as a country, and they're already in the market for buying surveillance gear. But the question then, of course, becomes what happens to distributors and what kind of, um, what kind of intermediaries will emerge? And those of you who don't know this guy, this is Victor Boot, one of the, uh, probably the world's most famous art smuggler who is currently in detention in, uh, in Manhattan, uh, who made his money and his fame by um, trading more or less arms and supplying them from Western Europe uh, to Africa, Latin America, and other, and other states and continents. The question is, if Victor Booth was to start his career today, would he choose to be in the surveillance business? And I think it's not an unreasonable question to ask because the more sanctions we impose, the more intermediaries will em eventually emerge who will do their business by essentially finding failed governments in, you name it, Moldova, South Sudan, Azerbaijan, or any other country, um, convincing them to purchase surveillance gear from America and Europe, they would be able to purchase that surveillance gear because there are no currently sanctions against them, and then convincing those governments to ship that gear to country X, whether it's Syria or Iran. I think this is quite realistic and this will be happening, and the fact that we already saw some shipments that were destined to be in Iraq uh, end up in Syria suggests that we may already have some people who are like Victor Bott, uh, who operating uh, as uh, intermediaries uh, in this business. And the other note that I want to make on sanctions is that uh, sanctions differ in their scope and in their usefulness. You have some sanctions which um, hurt ordinary users. America has plenty of such sanctions. Uh, they, uh, for example, have sanctions on uh, technology companies, any technology companies doing business in Syria 
which ends up hurting ordinary Syrian users. So ordinary Syrian users have problem buying credit on Skype uh, because there are sanctions uh, that make it very hard, not impossible, but very hard for technology companies to actually do business. They have to go and obtain all sorts of licenses, which then ends up hurting users. I know of a few examples of American sanctions, for example, which single out particular individuals. They would say that American companies are prohibited doing business from individual X, and then you know, his last name and first name and whatnot. And what we would see is that some American companies, especially internet hosting companies, would refuse to do business with any nationals of that country because they do not want to verify that the person buying the internet hosting is not on the sanctions list. Right? So there are some secondary unintended consequences from sanctions which may actually hurt ordinary users. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. While governments, by the way, often manage to get away. A recent discovery by, I think it was Citizen Lab, uh, found that uh, various extremist entities and government entities of Syria actually host their websites in Canada and the US. Uh, even though, again, that goes directly in violation of the sanctions, but government entities have all sorts of secondary players they can rely on and solve their problems. So again, I would urge you to think very hard about what some of the unintended consequences might be. Narrow sanctions, on the other hand, uh, are good, but they're often very ineffective because, again, governments set up other shell companies that take the role of companies that are banned by, say, the European Union. Now there are sanctions against doing business with some Syrian companies that work in the telecom industry. If you look at the justification for those sanctions, they say that those companies are just shell companies for the Syrian government. Uh, again, you ban one company, another company pops up, and you continuously need to monitor to make sure that those companies are not connected. One of the suggestions that has been proposed uh, in which to solve this problem was to force companies to actually monitor who their customers are and to do more due, due diligence uh, on those firms. Uh, and I think it's probably true that it's much easier to open, uh, to actually buy surveillance gear in the US than to open a bank account in the, uh, any American bank, in part because the banking industry has been forced to do due diligence on their customers. They have to verify, and again, many of us don't like it because it uh, creates more problems for privacy, it creates, again, additional surveillance, but there are justifiable rules and regulations that can actually make sure that our own Western technology companies that do business with clients in the Middle East actually engage in better monitoring of what's happening, not just at the time of sale, but also at the time of use. Whenever those technologies are used, there needs to be a way to monitor who's using them, how those technologies are being modified, uh, and so forth. Again, in the case of uh, area that the Italian firm and NetApp we do have evidence that NetApp's engineers actually knew that the technology ended up in Syria, which again says that we need to make sure that engineers don't just say, hey, we know it's in Syria, but that they actually take action, engage in whistleblowing or whatnot. Another interesting debate that I think is beginning to happen uh, in Western Europe and in the US is how much of this know your customer rule, we can actually delegate to technology. And here I think it will be very provocative, a controversial debate, which many of you would probably participate in, to what extent we should actually have kill switches on uh, technologies that are used for either surveillance or censorship. I know the general argument against kill switches in this crowd would be that they're just evil and bad, but when such evil technologies are used on, say, uh, technologies that are used for web filtering, I just don't see how random hacker turning off that uh, technology would actually be a bad thing. So I think there are some valid debates to be had. WebSense, for example, now claims, and WebSense is a technology that provides web filtering. They claim that they actually monitor where their technologies are being used, and they manage to monitor 40,000 customers. And if their technology ends up being used in Syria, they just make sure that they either don't update it or that they somehow remotely uh, turn it off, which again, I'm not sure if that's actually happening, but they claim to be engaging in continuous due diligence. The question here, of course, is very complicated, and it's how can we justify using more surveillance or more kill switches when we actually talk against surveillance and kill switches <laughs> generally? And this is what would be needed. Uh, there is no other way to monitor what's being done with this technology except for requiring technology companies to engage in more surveillance of their customers, which again, may be justifiable in the case of Iran, 
or in the case of Syria, but we need to make sure that the same thing is not happening um, when clients in the West are using it. So again, a lot of controversial ground, but I would like to urge that to, just to point out that this is not my wild thinking. Those are actually some ideas debated by some NGOs like Access Now, for example, in the US. So it may be happening, and I think it's useful to participate in some of these debates. Uh, what to anticipate, I think the situation will probably in the short term get worse. It will get worse because on the one hand, I think the situation in the Middle East is not so easy and clear cut as it seems. Uh, the, Libyan, the new Libyan government, for example, started engaging in social filtering, which means they now ban pornography websites, which were not actually banned under Gaddafi. Uh, Al Jazeera reported that in Arabic last week, which is a very disturbing development, but again, it may reflect that there will be more controversial schemes depending on which way the situation is going in both Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt. And of course, the situation is radically different in all three, but even in the countries which have supposedly been liberated by the Arab Spring, I would argue that the situation is not as clear cut as it seems. We may actually be seeing more and more use of filtering and surveillance in different formats uh, in each country. But what troubles me is that if you look beyond the Middle East, the situation uh, also promises to get worse. That's a report from a news site from about September of this year, and for those of you who don't know, CSTO stands for Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is kind of a NATO block of the former Soviet Union. Those guys are getting increasingly concerned about the Arab Spring, uh, and their first intent is, of course, to uh, boost their monitoring and surveillance systems. So we are beginning to see more cooperation within those countries. We see them passing um, a strategy document, list of steps aimed at securing the cyberspace of the member states. And they are very explicit in saying that what they want to do is to prevent another Arab Spring. One way to do it would be to engage in more surveillance. So those countries, and that's a region I know well because I come from it, those countries have not engaged in purchases of surveillance gear to the extent that countries in the Middle East and Southeast Asia have engaged in it. So we will see new customers. We don't know really what's happening in Russia, how much data is actually being stored by the ISPs on demands from FSB. It may be the case that all of the data passing through the former Soviet Union somehow ends up stored by uh, those ISPs. And it may be the case that Russia will come to the aid of some of those countries if they need to identify a particular blogger. Again, this is something to keep an eye on. I'm just arguing that probably in that particular region, the situation will get much worse than it used to be. Another disturbing development that at least I find troubling is that China is beginning to flex its muscles and its companies are beginning to very aggressively spread throughout the world. That's a map of Huawei's presence in Africa. Huawei, as you know, is one of the largest uh, mobile network, mobile equipment companies on par with uh, uh, Nokia, Siemens, uh, and others uh, that are actively spreading around the globe and that are supplying technology uh, that, uh, again, is configured in a way to enable a uh, lawful intercept. Uh, the fact that they're so cheap and that very often the Chinese government actually helps to subsidize the implementation of those networks because it fits within the Chinese foreign policy is also something very troubling and I think that we need to keep a closer eye on. I think this map is actually outdated by a few years. I would guess that if you look at Huawei's presence in Africa now, virtually every single country would be covered. But you also see news items like this, which mostly go unnoticed. So this is a very tiny item about China's economic aid to Moldova, which would not normally appear on anyone's screen of people sitting in this audience, but if you read it very closely, you actually see that the Chinese are now supplying the Moldovan government with video surveillance systems, which again they claim is for just monitoring road traffic. But again, in the times of protest, and we have seen those protests in Moldova in 2009, they can be turned against the protesters and used in you know, identifying them or at least tracking them or whatever. All of that is happening for free from just the benevolence of the Chinese state. Something much closer to where I come from, from Belarus, uh, now there are also negotiations between the Chinese and the Belarusian governments about, again, who are they supplying some video surveillance technology. Right, and why the local office of Huawei says that it's just for you know, very banal uses, traffic management, long distance education, local security, but the Russian government, when asked by the Wall Street Journal, was actually much more open about the real purposes and said, yes, it's for monitoring town centers and potentially preventing terrorism and whatnot. Um, again, the extent to which this is subsidized by the Chinese government, we don't know. The extent to which uh, this is built in a way to actually facilitate 
uh, surveillance by the government for political purposes, we don't know, but this is something that is worth to keep an eye on because what the Chinese are doing in this space is much less visible to us in the West, but it's also much harder to convince the Chinese companies with the same kind of persuasion that we can convince the Western companies, right? They do not react. They do react somewhat, and I'll give you some examples of them actually changing their behavior, but it's much harder to convince them than to convince, say, Nokia Simmons. Um, Another thing, again, related to surveillance, which I just would urge you to look up, is that you actually have some Western academics. People, in this particular example, academics who work at the University of California in Los Angeles and UCLA, uh, who are actually taking money from the Chinese government to set up nonprofits and institutes where they basically hire uh, you know, uh, people who label whatever they see in the photos and then they combine it with their software and they end up with this very nice uh, image to text systems, which actually solve one of the main challenges in video surveillance. They make it intelligent and that way it makes it easier to search because now you can search videos through text because whatever is being seen on those photos is being labeled, right? And there is some metadata and it's easier to search it. Now the question is, why do we have people people who are working in American and Western universities taking money from the Chinese government uh, to build such surveillance systems. Some of it may be entirely benign and benevolent, but I would argue that there is not enough attention uh, paid to what's actually happening in this field. And I would say that there are many emerging technologies like this. I'm not talking about lawful intercept, I'm talking about something uh, much more cutting edge, you know, automated facial recognition technologies, all sorts of data mining uh, techniques, which are still quite rough and which require quite a bit of academic expertise uh, to be fully developed. And I think this is an opportunity to keep a closer eye on all sorts of academic institutions who are taking money from either big companies and big governments. And you know, China is an obvious elephant in this room, and I think we need to be much more careful in terms of what research is being done and to sensitize the researchers to the implications of what it is that they're doing. Now, the more upbeat part of this presentation, what can actually be done by ordinary uh, activists and netizens and people concerned with the future of the internet. And here I would say that there are three things to be done, and I would present each of them in advance, and I think there is some kind of a pyramid that is emerging. I think, first of all, it's very easy for us to turn the tables on surveillance industry and start engaging in surveillance of that industry, right? It's becoming easier and easier to actually monitor <coughs> what they're doing, in part because these companies have been careless in the last few years, and they have really <laughs> been operating with the degree of publicness that they shouldn't have, given the atrocious thing that they're doing. So for some investigative journalists, you know, this is Varian uh, Silver from Bloomberg. You know, this guy wrote a book tracing a 2,500-year-old, uh, you know, chalice from Troy, and now it turned his attention to investigating what this technology company is doing. I mean, this is a dream come true, because you can actually engage in very nice investigative work, be tracing the shipments. For investigative journalists, this is great. But I would argue that also for people who are not card-carrying investigative journalists, who are people who sit, you know, their computers like most of us, it is also possible to engage and start keeping a close eye on these companies. So this is, comes from a website run by the Sunlight Foundation in the US, uh, their lobbying tracker. You can actually see that uh, Blue Coat uh, Systems, that company that hired, that was selling filtering technology to Syria, claiming that it was going to Iraq, you know, hired lobbyists. And you can actually go and check who those lobbyists are. You can read an entire PDF showing you where they come from. A lot of this information is public, right? So keeping an eye on some keywords, you know, expert controls on this website, or keeping some keyword that would be, you know, expert of surveillance technology would actually allow you to see what's changing, who's hiring whom. Again, this was not well reported. I, I only saw a reference to this lobby as being hired by Blue Coat in uh, Washington Post. And there was a good reason why Blue Coat hired them because they were about to be sold. And they actually, in the middle of this news about them selling technology to uh, Syria, they actually sold the company at twice the market capitalization for about $1.5 billion. So they definitely needed a lobbyist. What I'm saying is that we can actually see some of the underneath uh, processes if you pay clo close attention to sites like this. Uh, Telecomics, I think, did an amazing job with setting up this wiki blue cabinet where 
You can actually uh, go and report on what some of these companies are selling, link to uh, reports, link to news reports, link to particular news items. Uh, again, I think it's a very useful project. It needs scale. I think if all of you go and start investigating each of these companies and adding more information to it, I think we'll advance much more, but also the media will advance much more. Uh, just to give you well, this one other example, uh, law, national media still plays an influential role as opposed to global media like Bloomberg. So Bloomberg has been reporting on this Italian company uh, area for a few weeks, if not a few months. It didn't really cause much damage to the company until Italian newspapers picked up the story. So Corriere della Sera picked up the story, began interviewing the executives within a few days. And of course, there were also protests against areas, some of them by the local pirate party, which also received news attention in the Italian media. Uh, after that happened, immediately areas said, no, we're exiting this market, right? We're exiting this business. I would argue this wouldn't have happened if it was just Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal. You do need local media to engage, whether it's newspapers in Italy or in Germany or in France or in Denmark or in Sweden and in all of those countries you have plenty of local companies engaged in this trade. So making sure you find the local equivalent of whoever does this job for Bloomberg or whoever does this job for Wall Street Journal will be amazing. Convincing your editors that you need to dedicate a team and that's what happened with Bloomberg. Those people are dedicated to tracking this industry for a year and you know, they do make results. So uh, if you have any influence with your national newspapers, go and argue that they need to dedicate people to track particular companies and, and how they engage in this. Investors can be persuaded as well. Uh, some of you may have seen this item from earlier this year when um, one particular uh, financial fund actually decided to divest from Cisco because they couldn't get satisfying answers about Cisco's work in, um, in China. Uh, again, tracking who invests in those companies, tracking where they get their money, and then pressuring the investors, I think, is another thing to do. But also investigating individual companies. So I was, was while, while doing research with this keynote, I came across this company, Polaris Wireless. And I saw that it was mentioned in the spy files, but there were no files attached to it. It was just mentioned amongst you know, hundreds of companies by Wikileaks and others. There was no brochures, nothing. And it may just be that they're slow in scanning the brochures, but there was nothing that you could find. So I did some digging around online, and you know, it looks like a respectable company, has a very respected venture capitalist funding its work. And then I read an interview with one of their executives, and basically they very openly and blatantly say that their technology is being used by government agencies in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific regions you know, to, to engage in surveillance. This is something that's being said on the record, right? They're not afraid of that being public knowledge or anything. So I started digging, and then they figured out what it is that they actually sell. Right? They sell technology which basically allows them to track gatherings of people with mobile phones, you know, create some kind of a geofence and monitor anyone who enters it, what their mobile phone is, their identity, do it in real time, do it historically, so you can actually go and track who was where at which time, uh, you know, on what day, and thus, you know, they claim it's all for tracking terrorists. It's very easy to use this technology to track protesters, right? You can go and historically analyze who was where at a given public square at what time, and then go and do whatever you want with those people, right? And they're actually promising that they will also hook it up to some kind of data mining uh, and start incorporating, you know, social data, social media data to assess risk, right? That seems like, wow, and these people are so public about it. And then you just read some more news reports, and you see that they just opened an office in the Middle East, based in Dubai, where they're planning to sell even more surveillance technology to those governments. You see they just doubled their manpower in India. It's been a very good year for them. Right, but the, the reason why I'm showing you these slides is that because this company has more or less avoided any public scrutiny so far. The media that write about them are mostly technology media who don't actually care about the surveillance implications. But I think it's worthwhile that someone places a call to them and asks those companies, what exactly you are selling to the governments in the Middle East? Why exactly have you opened this office? Uh, what exactly you are saying from Dubai? And by the way, they will be present at the big uh, surveillance fair that's happening in Dubai uh, in 2012. So this is something that can be done by individuals. This is something that can be done by bloggers or people interested in this, whether by modifying you know, the, the wiki of um, uh, telecomics or just by following up on the reports in Bloomberg. I don't think that given the crisis in investigative journalism that we have these days, that even newspapers and news outlets like Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal would be able to go and investigate 100 companies. 
This is something that needs to be done in a crowdsourced manner, and I think this is the kind of subject that can actually be tracked down from open sources because these companies have just been so public about it. You know, some of those companies have huge allies, which again can be embarrassed. Uh, the investors can be embarrassed. And this is something that, again, needs to be investigated and studied, and this is something that individual bloggers can do. I mean, not only do these companies have allies, some of them also have huge balls claiming that they're actually proud to be supplying technology to Iran, right? And again, this is something that boggles my mind, but uh, this stuff needs to be tracked, and the executives need to be questioned about what exactly makes them so proud to be supplying this technology uh, to some of the most authoritarian governments um, in the world. But I think a much more ambitious task, and if you think of this pyramid that I've tried to draw, if this basic investigative work, crowdsourcing data gathering about technology companies, is at the very basis, at the very foundation of this pyramid, I think the second important task is for us, for activists, for journalists, for intellectuals, for technologists, to start linking the sales of this technology to authoritarian states to the actual developments uh, in domestic surveillance, in democracies. Again, this link has not been made by most news reports who think that this technology is built uniquely for the purposes of the Middle East. No, this technology is built for the purposes mostly of Western law enforcement agencies. And that's the next angle, I would argue, in talking about this technology when we talk about it to the public. You may have seen this letter, which for me encapsulates this debate really well. That's a letter from one of the women, one of the people who runs uh, this big surveillance fair that has generated so much coverage. I would urge you to go and read this letter in full uh, because it just, again, perfectly encapsulates the logic, both of the surveillance industry in the West, but also of the Western law enforcement agencies. I mean, I would just quote you the third paragraph, I think is worth reading in full. So this is a letter which she basically she's complaining to the Wall Street Journal editors that they have taken on this investigation. And she's claiming that, well, you know, the more guys you talk about it, the fewer jobs we will have in the United States because your news coverage threatens our jobs in the surveillance industry. So what she's saying in the third paragraph I think is very important. She's basically saying that uh, this coverage will create an atmosphere where Congress isn't likely to pass an updated lawful interception law. The law would require social networking companies to deploy special features to support law enforcement. Without the update, the opportunity for US companies to develop and launch intercept products domestically for eventual export will be greatly curtailed. Right? That's a powerful statement. If you actually read the whole thing, you'll see three things. Right? First of all, if dictators need any help in suppressing their uprisings, you know, we are here to help, we'll do it, it's, it's cool. Second is that, you know, our dictator helping jobs are going to China. And the third, which I think is the more important part, is that the main driver of this market are the needs of the U.S. law enforcement. And here, it was written in the U.S., I would add German law enforcement, British law enforcement, and so forth. So I think we need to ridicule all three parts to this logic, right? And I think the first one is very easy to ridicule. If you go and track the quotes from some of the people involved in this, those quotes are just ridiculous, and they do not stand any rigorous analysis by anyone who knows anything about logic, right? Or who knows the debate. So when you have Jerry Lucas who runs the surveillance fair claiming that this technology is absolutely vital for civilization, and that you can't have a situation where bad guys can communicate and you buy interception, no, that's actually wrong. I mean, right now, if you, Think about it, for a very long time, uh, law enforcement didn't have the interception capabilities, uh, and you know, they managed to track mobile phones, engage in all sorts of data mining, and they were doing fine. You know, they actually are solving everything that they need to solve without having the capability to break encryption or whatever. I mean, I'm just saying that this statement itself needs to be scrutinized because it relies on bad history and bad logic. And you can go through all of this and see that you can actually attack the premises there and embarrass the people making those arguments in the media or elsewhere. The second point about China stealing our jobs, I also think that this is somewhat ridiculous. I, I did point out that companies like Huawei and others are very hard to persuade. But actually, if you look closer, they also respond to embarrassing media coverage in Western media, in part because all of those companies have huge ambitions for the Western markets as well. So you have Huawei who's been trying to get into the American market for a decade now, and they cannot because they're suspected of having connections with the Chinese government. So every time the Wall Street Journal runs an argument, an, an article embarrassing Huawei for doing business in Iran, they get huge pressure to actually get out of Iran. 
So now they kind of committed to no longer seek new clients in Iran and to just to keep to their old clients and whatnot. Again, it may just be a smoke screen, they may still be involved, but that argument that somehow the Chinese companies will fill in this market, again, needs to be scrutinized. Some of those jobs can only be performed by giant companies like Huawei, and those companies also respond to embarrassing incentives. Um, this part about links to domestic surveillance, I think, is something where we need to focus our energy and intellectual effort and critical effort. If you actually read some of those reports from in intelligence fairs and surveillance fairs and balls uh, carefully, you'll see that it's not just representatives from Iran or you know, Syria or any other country that's mindless or authoritarian buying those technologies. You'll actually see that you, know, you have representatives from more than 35 government agencies of the US attending those fairs to buy their technology, right? including even the Interior Department's Fish and Wild File, <laughs> Wildlife Service. Right? It's, this is the real client industry. Those are the real people paying for those solutions. And I think we have to go back and look at some of the arguments that uh, FBI and other law enforcement agencies have been making about their inability to essentially work unless they have those lawful interception tools. This is where the real key to stopping that trade lies. It's not in sanctions, and it's being much more critical about the actual needs of our own domestic law enforcement agencies. So for those of you who don't know about FBI's going dark problem, it's basically an effort that FBI launched about five years ago where they are trying, uh, on the one hand, to build new laws and pass new laws that will allow them the same level of the ideal at the same level of lawful intercept to real-time communications on, say, uh, social networking sites or peer-to-peer -peer sites and services as they have with uh, phones. Right? So they want to be able to intercept real-time communications that fall outside of uh, existing laws um, more effectively. But they're also, in the meantime, they're not only trying to pass laws, they're also investing in tools. Right? And this is something that you need to understand, that they are investing in those tools, and this is where those tools come from. If you read the testimony of FBI's general counsel uh, to the Senate earlier this year, you'll see that she's actually very uh, open about uh, what FBI wants, and they do want to build new ways to intercept data, communications data in real or near real time. But what she's claiming at the very end, the second quote I think is much more interesting, She's basically saying that FBI understands that individual tailored solutions, which of course this industry creates to uh, uh, exist to provide, are not enough, and that they have to be the exception rather than the rule. Right? So she's basically arguing that, well, FBI doesn't want to take any blame for creating this industry, and that they would rather pass a new law and then drive that industry out of existence, which I think is a very clever rhetorical ruse. But for us, on the activist side, there is also something that we need to understand. So this quote comes from a blog post written by a staffer at EFF, right? And it doesn't get any more pro-freedom and pro-internet uh, liberty than EFF. And what basically the staff attorney is claiming is that as long as FBI can build tools that can do this job safely without compromising the user's privacy or other users being very secure. You know, basically, if they can build a perfect Trojan and use it for surveillance, then it's much better than updating uh, and passing new laws. And if you see that the kind of arguments she invokes here, there is nothing here about these tools than being used by authoritarian regimes. Right? It's all about the efficiency and the effectiveness of building tools that are not overreaching. And I think now, after we have seen uh, what we have seen this year, that argument is no longer tenable. And what I mean by this, it's not that suddenly we should all go and embrace you know, a new version of Kalia, which will be this law that will require you know, building backdoors. What I mean by this is that we also need to consider that building individually tailored tools to monitor users also have secondary effects, and those secondary effects are basically entrenching dictatorships around the globe. So this is something that we need to consider, and this is actually good, because if you think about it, it actually allows us to argue against Kalia, right? It allows us to say that, look, right now, we are already at a point where FBI has created an industry where they can monitor everything they want, and that if we build Kalia too, right, it will actually strengthen the authoritarian governments even more, because then the dictators will have access to the same backdoors. I think this is a very good rhetorical opportunity 
for people in this movement to actually start actively arguing that these tools are enough. We have to regulate them, we have to sanction them, but there is no way that FBI should invoke their need to build a new law that would require building backdoors. I think this is very important for the media to pick it up, because if they don't pick it up, we'll continue talking about sanctions, sanctions, and nothing else but sanctions. There is a broader opportunity here which does relate to domestic debate, and I think that's an opportunity that we need to embrace. The other point, the very last point of this pyramid that I've been trying to build and articulate, you know, when we start with investigations of these companies, continue to having a debate about domestic surveillance, I think the last point is trying to get the foreign policy element in all of this right. And what I mean by this is something very simple. We can, of course, ban Western companies from selling technologies to countries like Iran, right? It's much harder to make that argument to policymakers about Saudi Arabia because Western governments actually are quite okay with Saudi Arabia. No one wants to pass sanctions on them. So again, we need to make sure that our focus on tools and sanctions does not prevent us from also engaging in a broader foreign policy debate. I'll just give an example of how influential the existing foreign policy positions are in this. You consider the fate of Cisco. So Cisco, as all of you know, has been accused of supplying uh, routers to the Chinese and actually selling those routers with explicit arguments that you can use them to track down dissidents and your opponents. And lots of human rights groups are now suing Cisco, not just one, but several. It's a company that has a reputation problem, at least in this room, I would assume. So when you see a news item like this, this is a news item from uh, 2010. And it's basically a news item about the U.S. State Department taking a delegation of technology companies to Syria. You actually see that the State Department arranged a meeting for executives from Cisco with the Syrian president, right, and Syrian top executives. And how does it square with the rhetoric of internet freedom and everything else that, you know, the State Department and others have been advancing? Right? And the reason why that happened is because right until uh, this year, Syria was an ally. Right? So it was okay to be actually arranging shipments of routers, surveillance technology and whatnot to those regimes. Right? And nothing much has changed. You actually see that later that year, Cisco actually received an award from the State Department for its corporate excellence. Right? Given all the violations and all the lawsuits and whatever it has been having in China and elsewhere, it's still perceived as an ally in part because the countries it's been working on have not been a high priority foreign policy-wise. And it's not just American companies. If you actually read many of those reports in the Wall Street Journal and Washington Post and elsewhere closely, you will see that even, even you know, European governments and companies here are complicit. You know, the Wall Street Journal, for example, um, speculated that uh, the Libyans got their surveillance capacity while Gaddafi was visiting France, and he managed to negotiate uh, it with Sarkozy and his people. And uh, back then, again, Libya was seen as an ally. All I'm saying here is that we need to move beyond this focus on just uh, tools because we need also to scrutinize engagement, uh, current engagements that our Western governments have with these countries. Unless we scrutinize those engagements, we will never pass any laws that will prevent the sale of such technology to Saudi Arabia or Bahrain. Right? Iran is a very easy target. Everyone likes to hate Iran, whether it's the European Union, whether it's the US government, no one likes them. If you think, on the other hand, about Saudi Arabia or Bahrain, those are much more complicated cases, in part because we actually see American, and I would assume German weapons, uh, going to Saudi Arabia and others. I mean, 60 billion worth of weapons was sent to Saudi Arabia by the United States government alone. I mean, it pales in comparison to surveillance gear, whatever surveillance gear ends up in Saudi Arabia. Right, so what needs to change is not just us talking in the abstract about banning, you know, particular tools from being exported. We need to use this debate as an opportunity to scrutinize the engagement that our governments have with those regimes. And I think, again, with WebSense, I showed you an example where they claim that they monitor 40,000 of the users, and if those users end up in Syria, they would turn off their service. 
I would bet that they would not turn off their service if those users are in Bahrain or in, in, in Saudi Arabia, right? And again, that's a problem that needs to be solved and it runs much deeper than just the expert of particular tools and technologies. But I also think it's an opportunity for geeks and people who are beginning to think about it politically, whether it is through pirate parties or through telecomics or through other entities, to actually think much more explicitly about the foreign policy dimension to their work. Uh, I don't think it's a bad angle for these uh, entities to take, and I think there is some change that's possible, and I also think it's possible to actually rhetorically exploit the current fascination with the role of the internet in the Arab Spring to actually make a lot of arguments that are not so much about the internet, but that are about foreign policy per se. Because unless we start engaging in these issues in a much more political and strategic manner, we will still end up with many governments that are technically Western allies benefiting from Western technology. And I think I'll stop here, and we still have nine minutes for questions. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are mics, but I would assume that if you want to ask, yeah, there are, okay. I can't really see, so if you are burning to ask a question, just ask it. There is, yeah, there is a question in the back. Um. Could you elaborate on the sort of social filtering that you mentioned is being used in Libya? Yeah, again, it's something that uh, just came out. Uh, there was a one tiny report in Al Jazeera in Arabic, actually. I don't read Arabic. I saw one of my colleagues who tracks it uh, in Arabic who pointed me to that article. As far as I understand, they are beginning to uh, filter out pornography websites. Uh, and again, uh, that person keeps a close eye. He works for the Open Net Initiative. He, works, he keeps a close eye in Libya, and he claims that while Gaddafi was in power, uh, the only filtering that they had was political. So they would filter out access to websites that were specifically about Libyan opposition, but they would not filter access to you know, sites of pornography or you know, things like that. Uh, that's all we know. I haven't seen any information about it in English, but it's definitely worth following up if you work for the news agency or something. Um, hi, I think you gave too little credit to us for creating the market in the first place. If it weren't for our law enforcement agencies, the, the whole market wouldn't exist. You can't basically sure. blame the companies now for selling the stuff we made them build to other countries as well. And I think the solution is not to ban exports to Iran, but to ban the whole thing, make it like landmines. I mean, there will always be rogue nations like the USA will still build it, but I mean, you have, to, you have to ban the whole technology, otherwise it won't go away. It's not okay to export this shit to Denmark, you know, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. first place. It's not no. better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and I fully agree with you, actually, you know, and I think when I showed you some of the statements from those guys who are on the surveillance fairs, you know, when they say that civilization will collapse, if you buy interception. I mean, many people, I know the Washington scene really well because I live in America. Many people in Washington, who, in senators and their staffers who know nothing about technology, they actually believe those statements, right? So the question then becomes, how should people who are experts in technology, who are hackers, who know something, actually communicate that knowledge to an audience that is essentially technical? As you have seen, all of those technology companies have lobbyists. All of them have communicators. All of them know how to control the conversation. Right until now, with an exception of this news coverage in Bloomberg News and Wall Street Journal and elsewhere, I didn't see anyone actively seeking the perspective of you know, the guys like you in the audience. Right? So the question may be how to build an effective communication strategy and how you can actually make sure that this conversation is not dominated by lobbyists but actually reflect fact-based evidence that can point and say that, look, you didn't have intercept capabilities for a few years, civilization hasn't collapsed. But it's a question of communications, and I think it's something that needs to be addressed maybe even in the context of this event. And you do an amazing job of communicating this knowledge to five, 7,000 people. 
I'm just curious if there are any staffers who work for U.S. senators in this audience. And, you know, and it's probably that you wouldn't even want to have any staffers working for U.S. senators in this audience. But unless they hear your message, the conversation will be conducted you know, and dominated by people who claim civilization will collapse. So that's a problem that you guys need to solve is how to communicate. It's not necessarily a problem of, uh, you know, uh, having to make any further proof that civilization won't collapse. I don't know. Yes. Um, I have um, hey, over here. Hello. Um, I think one, one thing we as activists can do is point out um, how differently surveillance is sold to governments and to citizens, especially in democracies, especially in Europe. So data retention is sold to governments. It's the ideal solution to track groups of um, opposing interest, whereas it's sold to the citizens as something um, that helps you and protects you from terror. And I think this is one of the lines we can also, we can also hit and make, make it clear that for the government, mm -hmm. this means something totally different than they communicate. No, I, I, mean, I fully agree. Uh, again, a lot of this is a question of making those arguments visible in public. But I think also the Arab Spring provides an excellent rhetorical opportunity where you guys can essentially hijack a very emotional narrative about the struggle for democracy in the Middle East, which still dominates a lot of newspapers, and make sure that you actually do talk about things like surveillance and you do end up making arguments about what's happening back at home. One of the weaknesses of these articles in Bloomberg and in Wall Street Journal, I think, was that very few of them actually trace the roots of the problem to domestic surveillance. And that's, I think, the next step. And I think it's, if, if you manage to in, insert yourself, if you will, in those conversations, you would actually be able to lead them uh, you know, in, in whatever direction you want. Point the limits of domestic surveillance, point the pointlessness of some of the struggles against terrorism. All of that is possible, and now's the time to do it. I'm afraid in a year, the media attention will not be there. I, yes, Jake. I, I think so your talk was awesome, and it's very timely. So thanks for, for having it. Um, I think it's important to note that you say so-called lawful intercept yeah. instead of just lawful intercept, because what this is is actually an expansion of police powers, at least in most of the places in which this technology is being developed. It would be an expansion in the countries where it's developed. It's also an actual capability expansion in the places where it's sold, like in Syria. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's something to, about that. And so I think framing it as an expansion is very important, and we should reject the expansion just as we should actually reject the core itself. But I would, I would take it a step further, and I should say we should find the individuals who run the companies, photographs of them, their Facebook profiles, all that stuff, and we should publish that information, because these people are essentially like Deutsche Homag during the Second World War with IBM. These companies know that they're committing human rights abuses. They custom tailor the software, they update them. It's not like when you sell a car. Right? Mm -hmm. The ISS people, when they threw me out of their wiretappers ball in Washington, D.C., they said, hey, you know, we just sell this stuff and it's like a car. And it's really important to note that it is not like a car. It's, it is more like a tank where you say you are going to provide service and you're going to provide ammunition and you're going to provide ammunition that specifically targets Falun Gong people. And that's important, right? So it's an expansion where they individually target people based on political, social, sexual, and so on, and, and other beliefs, as well as actual properties that are, that are intrinsic to those people, and then they kill them. Mm -hmm. And that's what they do with this technology. It's an arms industry where they murder people. And so an expansion of murdering people is, I think, a really serious problem. Yeah. And, and so what we can do, though, is we can find the people that are involved with that, and we can turn the tables on them and own the shit out of all of them. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I agree with, with, with most of what you said. Uh, again, I think it's even worse than that because it's very problematic. To me, it's actually nonsensical to be talking about something like lawful intercept in the context of Iran or Syria, where the government can ban any laws at once, and that you know the, the, the very category of lawful kind of disappears and dissolves in many of those states because the respective rule of law doesn't really exist. So as long as these technologies are being developed on the premise that, hey, they are evil, but because we have laws, we can actually direct and control that evil in the West, 
that just doesn't apply in the authoritarian states at all. And I think we have to be quite explicit in saying that something that is explicitly recognized as a technology for lawful intercept or so-called lawful intercept is not at all lawful by any standard measure when it's used in a dictatorship because there are no rules of law and no systems that will actually regulate its use. So this is also a rhetorical opportunity that I think needs to be exploited. In terms of tracking those companies, Again, I, I'm all for tracking the executives and exerting pressure. It's just that I know that some of the researchers and some of the media who try to go after, say, a company like Trovicor, which is based here in Germany, are basically being told that if you misrepresent what we are, what we say, we take you to court. Right? And then the question is, how can we actually make sure that our media can report on those companies so those companies threaten to take those uh, media and, and basically sue them out of existence? And that's something that is probably much better to be done by individual activists, you know, anonymous or any other sources than to be done by Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal because those guys have lawsuits to lose and anonymous has so many lawsuits to lose at this point that one more lawsuit wouldn't matter. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I think I'll stop here. Uh, well, okay, one last question. Now, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, oh.